Okay, we are recording and we're streaming. Great. Um, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is January 30th, 2023. Um, it's one o'clock and I call this meeting to order. Very quick update to the agenda. Uh, the staff um, are recommending a social equity status denial and an approval of an employee ID card applicant with a criminal history record that has a presumptively disqualifying offense. So I'd like to add an executive session to the agenda to discuss the specifics of those two recommendations. Um, I think we should do that um, between the executive director report um, and then before the board votes on the full recommendations. Um, it's so nice to be back in 2023. Uh, we certainly have a lot on the agenda today. Um, so my remarks will be brief, but um, I just wanted to touch on um, an issue. We've received quite a few public comments recently about our decision to shift to a monthly board meeting from a weekly board meeting. Um, so I figured I'd start out by addressing that. Um, <clears throat> The board's early work was heavily dictated by some very aggressive statutory timelines that were even further compressed uh, by the pandemic related delays that we saw. Um, you know, we had to seek uh, a lot of public input. We had to draft regulations. We had to build an IT infrastructure and get licenses in the hands of applicants at a breakneck pace. However, as this market develops, our mission uh, at the CCB is starting to shift. Um, in addition to issuing licenses, we now have to focus on supporting licensees, which includes a heavy emphasis on education. And we also have to do the basic regulatory function of enforcing our rules. Staff time is a finite resource. And when new responsibilities are added to our plate, it means we need to cut some cut back someplace else. Um, in this case, we can be internally more efficient and expand the reach of our limited resources by shifting to a monthly board meeting. And I think that last phrase, monthly board meeting, is important. Um, you know, now that we have licensees and we're seeing that there are specific areas of our rules and the underlying cannabis laws that need more attention and education, um, while the board is only meeting once a month, we have on our event calendar probably three to four events uh, a month. So we are having events uh, continuously. Um, you know, those are not board meetings, but they are Q&A sessions and issue specific education and networking events. We have one this Thursday, for instance, from 5 to 6 p.m., where we will be discussing how to stay in compliance with the, De the Vermont Department of Taxes and how to navigate some of the complexities of filing taxes when you're a cannabis business. Um, for what it's worth, uh, I did look through the meeting schedules of every other adult use state, um, every other adult use cannabis board or commission, and save one, they all meet either monthly, once every two months, or once every three months. So I know it's not satisfying to hear, but this is the decision we've made and um, we're gonna stick through it at least through June. The best thing you can do if you're thinking about getting a license is to start your application early. Pay close attention to the communications you're receiving from the board about the areas of your application that are incomplete. And please, I can't stress this enough, start the process with fire safety as soon as possible. Um, later in the meeting, Brent is going to walk through some of the internal performance measures that we've collected about how quickly our staff can review applications or conduct a site visit. But we don't control fire safety. And on the same token, we're not going to approve an application until they've signed off on it. Um, you know, in my experience, they actually have a pretty impressive clearance rate generally, but they operate in a first come, first serve fashion and they also have a lot on their plates. You can't expect fire safety to expedite a site visit just because your cannabis application is otherwise complete. In other news, um, you know, the Agency of Administration released their year-end tax data for Vermont, which now includes a line item about the cannabis excise tax. 
And um, it looks like the state is reporting a little over 6 million in sales between October and December. Um, I think this is a very healthy start to this market. And, uh, you know, to me, it shows that the kind of over 21 population in Vermont and our Vermont tourists and border residents are embracing the idea of purchasing regulated cannabis over the counter. And the more that the board can do to improve market access, expand testing and manufacturing capacity, and increase the diversity of products that are available, I think, you know, we'll see this industry really kind of reach its full potential. A quick note to retailers that are selling pipes, bongs, rolling papers, or any other device that could be used for smoking cannabis, but also, also could be used for smoking tobacco. Um, DLL, the Department of Liquor Control, um, their reading of the current laws is that you are required to get a tobacco license and you are subject to their jurisdiction with respect to those products even if you're not selling cigarettes or tobacco products. We got word last week that a DLL enforcement officer conducted a compliance check on a cannabis retailer that was selling glass pipes. Um, just like the CCB, DLL takes an education first approach to enforcement of its rules. Um, but I think it's important for anyone who might be considering selling glass pipes or any sort of tobacco paraphernalia um, to know that this co-jurisdiction exists. Um, I wanted to say a quick word about hemp and hemp derived products. We're very much aware of the FDA's recent comments about CBD. Um, we don't know the full implications of this decision other than to say that the sands are shifting under everyone's feet. Prior to the FDA statement, we submitted a legislative report um, on the regulation of hemp derived products in, in Vermont. Um, however, this issue plays out federally, um, at the state level, we will be seeking public input and legislative input um, when it comes to regulating hemp derived products in Vermont. Julie, I know you wanted to touch on an issue. Mm -hmm. Before we do that, I just wanted to do a very brief introduction um, and put a face to the names of our two newest members of our compliance team. I'll start with Dwayne Tomlin. If you could just you know, wave at the camera. Um, um, he brings an extensive background in security as well as a deep knowledge about the cannabis plant. Andy Sheverfields, if you wouldn't mind just waving. Um, comes to us from the Department of Health, where at least part of your job was serving as a public health inspector and manager for the food and lodging program. So given you know, the breadth of the job our compliance team has to achieve, including regulating, overseeing every piece of the supply chain, um, I think your experiences and expertise will really help round out the compliance team. So we're thrilled to have you on board. Happy to be here. I uh, look forward to meeting everybody. Julie, do you want to? Um, yeah, I wanted to um, call attention to something that I'm noticing, and it, I see it more and more as our staff uh, builds and grows, and I think it's time to address it now. We're seeing a pretty distinct difference in the treatment from the members of the public and uh, people in the cannabis industry towards members of our team, and it's pretty clearly based on gender bias. Uh, it's not always blatant or overt aggression. Sometimes it is kind of suburb, like uh, like attempting to skip a typical process or procedure um, and go to a man on the staff with the intent of undermining a woman on the staff. I want to give people the benefit of the doubt. I think that a lot of this happens unconsciously and uh, perceptions of power and, and gender are definitely deeply rooted in our culture. I mean, how often have we thought of women as the weaker sex, right? For how many decades have we thought that? But that's shifting and uh, it's an evolving and changing uh, uh, item in our culture. And so not calling out anyone in particular, um, not blaming any particular group or organization for today, my ask of the cannabis industry and members of the public is to do some thinking about bias, where they show up and why we have them, and then to please treat our staff, all of them, with the dignity and respect they deserve. We see the disrespect happening and we'd like it to stop. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Julie. And I don't think I have anything further to add. Then why don't we um, approve our minutes from our last meeting? 
Um, that was on December 21st, 2022. Is there a motion? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And we will then now shift to our agenda. Um, Bryn, we have a statement or proceed. Okay. Is it the state? Is it the statement? The statement regarding yes. Delta <clears throat> I will do that. Um, so the board is going to be releasing an update um, to its hemp industry bulletin that we released um, a couple of months ago that articulates the board's stance on products containing, containing manufactured Delta-8, Delta-10, and other synthetic cannabinoids for which there's really insufficient research to demonstrate um, the safety of those, of those products. Um, Delta-8 and Delta-10 are psychoactive compounds um, that occur naturally in only very small amounts in the hemp plant. Um, the natural concentration is so low that they're unlikely to have any um, psychoactive effects on the consumer. Um, but Delta-8 and Delta-10 and these other um, uh, cannabinoids that can be synthetically made from hemp, producers are using a chemical process uh, to convert sometimes CBD into these uh, cannabinoids and create Delta-8 and Delta-10 products. Um, manufacturing Delta-8 and Delta-10 from CBD has become a way for manufacturers to create a psychoactive substance under the guise of being derived from legally produced hemp, which by definition does not have a high concentration of any psychoactive cannabinoid. Um, the, these products are not going to be registered uh, by the CCB and therefore are not going to be eligible for sale in our retail establishments. Um, as, we've, uh, as we've said repeatedly, we have not yet drafted our rule on hemp yet, um, but the goal here is to give the public really abundant um, notice that the policy position of the board is to prohibit the use of synthetic cannabinoids in the production of any hemp-derived products. And that doesn't mean that any naturally occurring Delta-8 or Delta-10 um, is barred from hemp or hemp-derived products but that um, Vermont producers can't be manufacturing the Delta-8 or Delta-10 um, cannabinoids from hemp. And the bulletin is going to contain further detail and it will be published um, in the coming days. Any questions for Bryn about that? No. No, oh, thank you. Bryn. Thank you. Okay, um, moving down the agenda, we're gonna review the Vermont Agency of Agriculture's new pesticide rule that was just approved by LCAR last week. Or is that you or is that Christine? That's the pesticide? The pesticide rule. Yep. <laughs> I am um, not reviewing the new pesticide rule. I am maybe talking a little bit about what the a couple of the aspects of the new rule regarding pesticides. That's great. This is what I'm going to do is do uh, just to underscore a few um, points of our current pesticide guidance that are important just to keep in everyone's um, front and center in everyone's understanding. So as the, the point about the new rule that's good to underscore is that we've proposed mandatory lab reporting on pathogens and pesticides. So um, that's something that should really help us to, um, in our, in our um, bid to really create trust with the consumer in our markets. Um, and coupled with our own, just on the ground, look at everyone's pesticide cabinets. Um, it's it's going to be a really, um, good combination. So I just wanted to uh, reiterate that the uh, licensee is responsible for knowing what is on these pesticide um, allowable lists, as well as what's on the, the not allowed list, which is handily on your COA, your pesticide COA. So um, I would just suggest that everyone get familiar with the allowed list that's on the pesticide guidance on the website. Print it out would be a really good idea and have it handy, um, as well as check your COA for those pesticides that we're testing for. Those are active ingredients, very popular active ingredients in a lot of 
black market um, cultivation. And with those two lists, the allowable lists and your um, residual list from the COA, you're well equipped to uh, vet new products, to go into a grow store and to um, speak with people about exploring new possibilities for management. Um, I also wanted to mention on our allowed list um, that that list is based on active ingredients. Unlike Massachusetts list, which is uh, restricted to 25B pesticides, which are minimum risk pesticides, um, our list is not so restricted um, we actually encourage you cho to choose EPA registered products that have those allowed uh, active ingredients um, when they're available. Also a huge misunderstanding is our allowed list is not based on whether or not products are organically certified. And this has been kind of a fairly large misunderstanding. Just because it's organically certified does not mean it wouldn't fail a pesticide test. So a very common example of this is the product Pyganic. It has an active ingredient, pyrethrin, that's on the restricted pesticide list. Just look on your pesticide COA and you'll see it down there, even though the product is certified organic. So I just wanted to make this distinction for everyone and that um, just because it's organic doesn't mean um, it's necessarily safe in our market. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, those pesticides on the COAs are residual pesticides, meaning they stay with the plant um, either on the tissues or systemically in the tissues for long enough that it is very likely that the consumer will come into contact with them as well as those chemistries then being subjected to all the things we do in our interest, industry, like burning, um, concentrating, um, extracting. So um, because of their very residual nature, they stick around. They also stick around in, in spray equipment. So be very, very careful. Um, and I would, I would say do not ever borrow used spray equipment. There's no way to clean spray equipment of residual pesticides. So just a note um, to be cautious there. So be cautious with um, the spray equipment. Be cautious when you're ordering that you have the good and the bad list. Don't rely on other people like grow stores to, um, to, do, to know these things for you. It's your responsibility. Um, and one final thing, our tracking system that we're developing will ask you for your application app data, so all of your foliar applications um, and nutrients biweekly. So if you're not already keeping an application log, um, it's a, this is a good time to start doing that. Um, and you can find, I think just by Googling, pesticide application log, you can find um, templates of logs that you could use or you can create your own. Um, that's about it. I just wanted to say we're, we're really developing a lot more pesticide, um, pest and disease management education and training. Uh, so um, just be looking for that to, to be coming. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions for Chris? I have one. Do and mm -hmm. this is just my own lack of awareness, but I know some folks will rent some types of farm equipment. It, are these sprayers something that people also rent? So I know folks maybe are borrowing them, but is it something that they might rent from somewhere else as well? They should know. They they shouldn't rent spray equipment. Yeah, I, I would say that would be something that I would really look to buying new. Um, and, and adulteration of pesticides by spray equipment is a common issue nationally. So it's, it's not just our market. Definitely something to be cautious of. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Anything else? 
Nope. All right. Um, next on the agenda is a presentation from Project WorkSafe about workplace safety. Um, Julie, do we know if uh, our presenter is... I think that Luke is here. Yep. Hello, everyone. Hi, Luke. Is Sean on also, or did he have to go? Um, he might still be floating around. I think he had to call in on the phone today, though. So um, oh, okay. hopefully he's floating around in the background here somewhere. Um, but yeah, um, so good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk to you um, today. Uh, again, my name is Luke McCarthy, and um, we just wanted to make you aware um, of a free state resource uh, that's available to you as hopefully you begin to stand up your uh, your businesses. Um, so hopefully everyone's heard of OSHA, um, Occupational Safety Rules, Regulations. I'm sure you've heard of the fines. Um, there's a service in Vermont to help small businesses learn about and comply with all of those OSHA rules. Um, and in Vermont, we call ourselves Project WorkSafe. Um, so we're not VOSHA. The use of the program is completely voluntary and it's completely confidential. Um, and I'm required whenever I give this pitch to tell you that it's funded mostly by your federal tax dollars. Um, so that's how we are able to keep it uh, a free service. Um, so the program operates in a couple different ways. <clears throat> Folks use us however they want. They'll either call us up, um, you know, with a or email us with a question, or uh, we go all the way up to going out onto their uh, their job sites to look at their operation or proposed operation if you're not entirely in business yet. Um, and then we can point out, you know, safety and health issues uh, and help you resolve those issues. Um, you know, through through that on-site visit, it gives us a good feel for, um, you know, where you're at with your safety and health efforts, uh, maybe where you should be, um, and, and what you need to do to get there. Um, so we can provide resources like um, written programs or, or, or training templates. Um, in a lot of cases, we can actually provide you uh, with, with training that's needed uh, for, from OSHA. Um, and we can provide uh, air monitoring and industrial hygiene work. That's all free as well. Um, you know, just anything that, that you need to help meet uh, or comply with those OSHA standards. Um, so that's, you know, that's who we are. Uh, that's a two minute explanation of who we are. Um, and I just wanted to put in a plug for the program um, for maybe those of you who you know, don't have it on the top of your head. Um, OSHA laws do apply to any uh, company that has one or more employee at any time in the calendar year. Um, and hopefully your businesses will be successful and you will grow. And once you hit a threshold of 10 employees, there's a whole other slew of record keeping requirements that will apply to you. Um, so, you know, when I say the OSHA rules apply to you, um, you know, maybe not so much on the retail side, but on the production side, you have a whole bunch of hazards that your employees uh, are exposed to um, that OSHA also has regulations for. Um, you know, you could have uh, air quality issues, including, you know, maybe exposure to mold or or even ozone, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. There's a whole slew of things. Um, so you might be looking at, you know, ventilation issues, uh, respiratory protection issues. Um, You've got potentially high levels of noise from fans or the very ventilation systems that are there to keep you safe. Um, you know, OSHA does require uh, a hazard communication program and training for any employee that's exposed to chemicals. Uh, and this would be separate from whatever regulations a pesticide program uh, makes you do. Um, you know, for your indoor growers, you've got electrical issues. Um, for your outdoor growers, OSHA does have an emphasis on heat. I know it's kind of hard to think about when it's 20 degrees and snowing out, but it is coming. Um, you know, and and you definitely have ergonomic issues uh, between processing and lifting and everything else. Um, and just an FYI, ergonomic issues are incredibly expensive workers' compensation claims. So, um, you know, we always kind of keep an eye out for those things when we go onto a site. Um, so, you know, there's just and then that, that's not that's some things that maybe are specific to your industry, but there's also things like fire prevention rules, fire safety, egress, um, you know, and obviously all, all the standards that are around personal protective equipment, like, um, you know, goggles and gloves and aprons if you use chemicals, that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, I don't want to go too far deep into each one of these topics. I could be here all day, but, um, you know, like I said, as as you 
start to get your business up off the ground, please keep some of these employee safety issues in the back of your minds. Um, and just know that there are, you know, not only are your employees exposed to them, but there are OSHA regulations that you have to comply with if uh, any of these uh, situations are in your facilities. Um, but, you know, please, if you have any questions, uh, you know, it's it, or need clarification on what your uh, requirements are as, a, as an employer, uh, feel free to give us a call. Don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, our numbers, it's pretty easy. It's 1-888-SAFE-YES. Uh, that's S-A-F-E-Y-E-S. -E and if you can't remember that, just Google Project WorkSafe. We're the first link that comes up and all of our phone numbers and emails are right there. Um, you know, again, it's it's a free service. We're here to help small businesses comply with the rules. Uh, and so, you know, your tax dollars are funding it. So please feel free to take advantage of it. Um, and that's that's my 10 minute pitch of, of Project WorkSafe. Great. Any questions for Luke while we have them? Um, Luke, if uh, if somebody wanted to go do a little research on their own to start before Project Work, WorkSafe came in and to figure out like what applies to them or what safety standards they should be looking at, where would they go? So, I mean, there are no safety standards right now specific to this industry. Um, OSHA kind of pulls in standards that are already written, you know, as you may or may not know, we haven't written anything new in decades. So. Um, you know, if you're not too familiar with the actual OSHA standards, there are actually there's a bunch of new research being done by states that have already had this uh, industry up and running. Um, there are a couple of um, if, if you just go on the Internet and start cruising for, um, you know, uh, safety issues in the cannabis industry. There are a bunch of great documents and publications out there um, and we can compile all that and and um, and send anybody who wants a nice little packet that's easy to read and digest. Um, we can, we're happy to put that information together. That's great. That would be really great. And just to put a finer point on that, even though there aren't specific industry standards, is this right, Luke? All employers have sort of a general duty to provide a work, safe workspace, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, OSHA is really good at applying standards to situations that they haven't really uh, thought of, but also there's, there's what's called a general duty clause where, you know, if they walk in and, and see something that is typically a, a accepted general accepted uh, uh, industry practice, uh, even though they don't have a standard specific standard for it, they can still cite what's called a general duty clause um, and 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 you know seek compliance that way. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, on, on that, so, you know, while there might not be a cannabis-specific OSHA regulation with respect to kind of cannabis edibles, there might be a, a, an OSHA regulation with respect to a product, like a food processor that would apply, um, or some of the equipment that might be at a cannabis edible producer's. Yeah, like, I mean, exactly. So... So, you know, there aren't rules for specific machinery associated with production in the cannabis world, but there are general rules for, you know, machine guarding and, um, you know, uh, compressed gases and, and, you know, all the, all the systems that are, are involved with, with the process. Just bouncing off that, I know, <clears throat> at least currently, cannabis isn't considered an agricultural product, but OSHA does have agricultural operation standards that might be a good starting point for folks to to think about and look at as it relates to the cultivation or production side of, of this, even as it relates to contractual employees, seasonal employees, et cetera, et cetera. And if Project WorkSafe, remind me if this is right, because I've, I've had Project WorkSafe walkthroughs in, in my past lives, right? So um, you can provide advice and walkthroughs and it, it there's time for an employer to remedy things or change things. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get fined, right? Like the idea is to teach safety, not to to find people right away, right? Like exactly, yeah. So our yeah. our program is different from VOSHA in that we seek voluntary compliance. We, you know, people contact us because they want to do better, and so we're not going to go out and you know issue a citation or or penalty. Um, th there is a caveat to having us out onto your site, and that is we cannot in good conscience walk away from a serious violation. So if there was a violation that VOSHA would, would cite you for if they walked in, like 
electrical hanging out of the wall or something, we would work with a, a company to to get that fixed. Um, you know, we're flexible with our time ranges. We know everyone's on a tight budget, but we do need to to get that issue fixed. Um, so that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the catch to using the program is that we do we do kind of force you to fix the things that we find. Um, so no penalties, no citations, no fines, but there might be some money involved with fixing issues. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Luke, uh, for a lot of the businesses that are entering this regulated market, um, they've largely existed in an unregulated area in the past. So this interplay between um, organizations that have co-jurisdiction, like I think the Cannabis Board has jurisdiction, Fire Safety has jurisdiction, the Tax Department has jurisdiction, OSHA has jurisdiction is what I'm hearing. And then OSHA, whether you knew that or not, you're subject to OSHA's regulations. Um, uh, by by being a kind of legitimate business. Um, and I hear that there's kind of an enhanced set of regulations that you're uh, subject to if you have 10 or more employees. And and, and what I'm hearing is that you, specific, or Project WorkSafe specifically, is there to provide technical assistance to help people understand those and to come into compliance with them. So that's that's the, absolutely like, there's correct. No, there's yeah. very little downside to giving you a call. That's right. Um, to just review what what things you might not have ever known about that, but you're subject to kind of a regulatory authority. Well, I'm a little biased, but yes, I think there's no downside to calling us. Um, like I said, it's confidential. So whatever we discuss with the client, you know, we always send a report out. That report stays between us and the client. It doesn't go to any other regulatory body. Um, so, you know, um, it's just a it's just a friendly conversation to help small businesses um, comply with what they need to comply with. And that includes the record keeping that you were talking about, right? I, I know that that can trip up some business owners, especially new business owners uh, in the beginning. Yeah, so so if you have less than 10 employees, you don't necessarily need to keep things like uh, injury logs and, and, and written programs. Um, but once you hit that threshold, you do have some record, record keeping requirements such as Keeping injury logs and making sure you 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 know you, you document all your um, you know let's say you have a, a big vessel that holds something that's something needs to go in and clean so that's what's called a confined space so you would need a confined space program training and all that stuff if you if you have less than ten employees the actual written policies are a little little you know more relaxed once you hit ten employees you got to start having all those those files and documents and everything else, um, you know, to say that this is our policy, this is what we do, this is how we train our employees. And most of that information is right on the OSHA website, right? Like what people are required to keep track of. Uh, yeah, it, it is, it takes some digging, but yes, it's there. <laughs> All right, anything else for Luke? OSHA can be complex depending on your business, so. Please reach out to Luke and his colleagues if you have questions. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we can <clears throat> emphasize the employee safety pieces enough. Quite frankly, I mean, a lot of the biggest injuries come from very simple, uh, uh, like it's slips, trips, and falls. Quite frankly, right, Luke? Like that's like the number one industry uh, injury, um, and small actions can result in in lifelong problems. So it's important to keep folks safe. Absolutely. And Great. again, I appreciate your time um, allowing us to, you know, spread the word. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get your, um, we'll get WorkSafe's contact information up on our website so people have quick access to that as well. Very much appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> next on the agenda is the, um, presentation of the CCD social equity report. By way of background, this is a report that the Cannabis Board is, uh, submits to the legislature every year. Um, and uh, this is the first year where I think we actually have licensees. Um, so there's some good information in there.
<clears throat> okay. So, yes, this report is going to detail the background of why we why we had to submit this. Um, but as the chair mentioned, um, this is the first year that we submitted our um, social equity report to the legislature, and uh, I'm going to go through it for everybody now. We'll start with uh, some background on the social equity program. That's the part that I might um, move through a little bit more quickly because um, I think everybody has a good sense of what the program entails. Um, and then it talks about the data on social equity within the industry. And I think that um, we'll, we'll take a, a little bit of a closer look at the numbers of social equity uh, licensees um, and applicants that are in the queue. And then we'll, the report details the Cannabis Business Development Fund beneficiary payments that um, the Agency of uh, Commerce and Community Development is administering. Uh, and then the end of the report kind of articulates some of the barriers or what the board um, sees as the biggest barrier to accessing the cannabis industry and then some additional recommendations for the legislature. So background on the program, we start with the requirements of the report. Um, this is a statutory requirement that uh, the board, in consultation with ACCD um, and the Executive Director of Racial Equity, report each year in January. This was the first year. Um, and biennially, biennially afterwards on the implementation of the social equity program that's required by the statute. Um, so it's going to include some data on the number of, um, the number of social equity applicants uh, and some details and data on the amount of funding that is, is provided through that Cannabis Business Development Fund, which we will talk about a little bit later. <clears throat> um, this is the board's mission statement on social equity and a little bit of a, just a kind of a general statement on the board's approach to social equity. I think the board is familiar with this. I'm going to skip that one. Um, so this slide details some of the work that the board has done so far to reduce disparities in um, participation in the cannabis market. Um, this is kind of an attempt to demonstrate that the board has really considered social equity in every aspect of its work. So for example, um, the board proposed comparatively low licensing and application fees to ensure that the barriers to entry um, were relatively low. Um, we've avoided imposing caps on the number of licenses to prevent creating an industry that reflects only those businesses that are the most well capitalized. Um, board staff has prioritized social equity applicants for licensure and for technical support. Um, the board has adopted rules that don't impose um, broad restrictions on um, whether or not you can get licensed based on your criminal history record. So the board considers applicants with criminal history records um, individually and limits licensure only to those individuals that would uh, pose a threat to the safety or proper functioning of the cannabis market. <clears throat> the board has also prohibited considering prior cannabis convictions as a sole justification for denial of a license. Um, and we've also imposed employment and subcontracting requirements on larger cannabis licensees and that is done in an effort to help ensure that the ancillary business activity that's generated by the cannabis industry um, benefits BIPOC people. So a little summary of the work that's been done so far. Um, this slide has links to the, the former legislative reports that we've submitted um, that have information about the social equity program and the development of the program. So, you know, this is kind of a summary that we've received really an extraordinary amount of public feedback when we were developing the social equity program, and that's detailed in the January 1st report. Um, and then the Jan October 15th report detailed um, the social equity criteria that the board developed um, that allows access to the program, which includes the waived or reduced application and licensing fees, access to technical assistance, um, and also eligibility for disbursements from the Cannabis Business Development Fund through ACCD. And we've also, sorry, we've also adopted economic empowerment policy, and I'll talk about this a little bit in the report as well. And the idea behind the economic empowerment was to support and encourage the participation of women, veterans, and minorities in the cannabis industry. 
So here is our social equity criteria. Um, I know that the board is quite familiar with these. Uh, if you are black or Hispanic, have served a sentence of incarceration in a correctional facility as a result of a cannabis related conviction or have a family member who has, or if you can demonstrate that you're from a community that's historically been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition and you personally have been harmed by that impact. Um, those are the four different criteria that can make a person eligible for the social equity program. Um, this is a summary of, of what the program offers. Um, so applicants that meet social equity criteria are prioritized for um, by the licensing staff and the compliance staff. So they are prioritized for application review, site visits, and technical support. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they also receive fee waivers and fee reductions. So a fee waiver um, in the first year and then reductions for the following three years. Um, the board hosts entrepreneurial outreach, education, and networking sessions for social equity applicants and licensees, and that is to encourage both participation, participation in the market and also um, you know, cultivate success among the existing licensees by fostering connections among them. Um, also, as I mentioned, social equity applicants and license holders are eligible from those disbursements from the Cannabis Business Development Fund that ACCD uh, administers. Economic empowerment benefits, um, somewhat more limited because these folks don't have access to the Cannabis Business Development Fund. They are not eligible from, for disbursements from the fund. But again, the board hosts outreach and education sessions that are targeted towards these folks um, to foster networking and support. And we've had quite um, good attendance at these sessions. Um, and we also prioritize them for review after social equity applicants. So I'll get into the data now on our um, social equity licensees. So we're starting off by a little um, a little trip down memory lane when we uh, did pre-qualification. So the board implemented a pre-qualification process um, early on when we were uh, prior to opening the first um, application window. And this process allowed applicants um, who intended to get a cannabis establishment license to get kind of official state approval um, for their team and their initial plans before they had to go out and secure real estate um, and do other kind of financially um, burdensome activities that would lead to them being able to open their business. So we had 222 applicants that were approved for pre-qualification um, and of those 202 applied for a license. And of those 202 pre-qualified applicants that applied for a license, 51 were social equity applicants. So those are some early numbers on our social equity program. Um, this slide details what our current population of licensees looks like from a kind of status perspective. So you can see the gray 61%, that is our standard applicants. Um, the blue 17% is our social equity um, licensees and the orange 22% are our economic empowerment licensees. So I said applicants, I think at first, but I meant licensees. This, these are numbers of just people who've had their licenses issued. This slide details the categories um, for the social equity criteria. When I went through those four categories um, of qualifying criteria, this is a breakdown of our current um, social equity applicants and licensees. So everyone that has been confirmed by the board to have social equity status is reflected on the slide. So black or Hispanic um, applicants and licensees constitute 50% um, of that group. 27% are um, qualified because they were formerly incarcerated in a correctional facility as a result of a cannabis related offense. Um, and then orange, the 23% um, are folks that had a family member who are incarcerated in a correctional facility as a result of a cannabis related offense. Um, and then the next several slides do this breakdown um, between social equity, economic empowerment and standard by license type. Um, so you'll see on the next several slides that the majority of our social equity um, licensees have applied for Sort of the smallest of our cultivation tiers. So you can see 10 applied for tier one indoor, 10 applied for a tier one mixed, um, and 
we've got six that applied and received a license for a tier one outdoor. Then we get to the manufacturing um, licenses. So the tier one, tier two, and tier three are reflected um, in the bars across the bottom of the graph there. Um, so you can see our tier two manufacturing licensees. Um, the majority of them are actually economic empowerment licensees, which is great. Um, and then this is our other license types. So we can see wholesale, retail, testing lab, and integrated. Um, down there at the bottom. Happy to slow down if you'd like. Oh, that's great. So moving away from that data, we're going to go look at some data on our um, demographics. And this really kind of um, implicates the economic empowerment program, but there's this slide just uh, provides a note on the data which is that um, on the following slides, we were really looking at licensees. So all of those numbers reflected the, the um, not each individual person um, who owns a cannabis establishment, but just the status of the cannabis establishment itself. And these next few slides um, really are designed to provide like a picture of economic empowerment in the industry, but the data is on an individual level as opposed to on a business level. So, um, and all data is of as of the end of the year. So here is data on gender um, of individuals who own or control a cannabis establishment business. So this includes applicants and licensees both. Um, and you can see that uh, the orange there, 14% are female. Um, the yellow, 24% identify as male. Um, we have only one individual who identifies as non-binary non and one who identifies as genderqueer. But you can see the vast majority there. I can't really see the number. I think it's 62%. Um, they just left it blank. So the this data is collected on our application form. Um, it is not, this is in the demographics section and there is no requirement that applicants complete the section of the application. So um, an important note on the data also. In our genderqueer and non-binary, are those options to select, or is that something that people write in? They are options. Okay, uh, this slide <clears throat> reflects the um, identified race of applicants, individual applicants. Um, so again, this includes applicants and licensees and all of the individuals, all the data on all the individuals that we collect um, from those businesses. So you can see the um, vast majority, 494 are white. It's the brown column all the way to the right there. And it's a smaller column of who chooses not to disclose. So it's only 30 that chose not to disclose their race. Interesting data to look at. So now I'm going to move on to the um, the slides about the business development fund. Um, so the statutory requirement is here, seven BSA nine eighty seven, or no, this I think is might be in Title thirty two. Anyway, um, no, it isn't. Okay, yeah, it's in Title thirty two. Okay, anyway, there is a fund that's set forth in statute. Um, and it comprises an initial um, appropriation of $500,000. And then it also comprises contributions of $50,000 per, $50, per integrated um, license. Um, and that is only for um, licensees that had an integrated license on or before October 15th of last year. And then any other funds that are appropriated to it from the General Assembly. And the purpose of the fund, you can see there is under subsection C to provide low interest um, loans and grants, social equity applicants, um, outreach uh, targeted to attract and support social equity applicants to Vermont's industry, um, assistance with job training and technical support, and, um, and that's it. Here's um, the language that puts ACCD in charge of administering uh, this program. 
So as I mentioned earlier, the fund is in the hands of ACCD and that agency is um, making the disbursements from the fund. So this is a summary of the technical support um, that has been provided to social equity applicants and licensees. So the ACCD contracted with Rhodes Consulting Group um, to provide technical support to social equity applicants and licensees. Um, they, that contract was a $150,000 contract. And so far, Rhodes has conducted intake assessments with about a quarter of our social equity applicants and licensees. Um, and there are some details about where those businesses are located. Um, and they've provided technical support for eight of those businesses. And um, you can see there the bullets are kind of a detail of what kind of technical support Rhodes is providing. So it's everything from marketing and bookkeeping to website development, branding, um, some financial management support. And this outreach and technical support are ongoing. Um, so although only a quarter have started the process, um, it's going forward, so um, social equity applicants and licensees are entitled to this support. So all those areas where they've provided technical support kind of, to me, look like they go, they're just general business needs, like whether you're a cannabis business or not. But Rhodes does have some cannabis specific technical like experience, right? They do, yes. They um, This organization, was used by both Rhode Island and Massachusetts to provide technical assistance specifically to the cannabis industry. So they do have that expertise. So I remember that, but I wasn't sure. And on those intake assessments, you kind of indicate where you need the most help. <clears throat> I think it would make sense how a lot of people feel like they have good knowledge of the plant and just need help. Bookkeeping, bookkeeping mm -hmm. and doing the things that every regular business needs to do. Yep. Okay, so this slide details um, the beneficiary payment plan. So $350,000 of that original 500,000 was reserved to provide the financial support um, to social equity businesses. So, um, that 350,000 covered one $5,000 payment to each business that's currently confirmed as having social equity status. So that may be an applicant or a licensee. And the second bullet here is really a note that um, this decision by ACCD to provide a equal flat amount to all of the applicants and licensees really doesn't account at all, obviously account for the really different needs um, of these businesses. And the agency decided to um, treat these businesses equally rather than equitably because of the limited amount available in the fund. Um, the had, had ACCD instead offered these beneficiary payments based on the business's need, um, we would have, they would have run through that fund very quickly um, and certainly before every social equity business had the opportunity to seek some financial support. Will there be some reporting by Rhodes or ACCD after the fact of like, are we going to survey folks to see whether or not this was impactful and how impactful and yes, is that part of the Rhodes charge? It is part of, okay. it is part of what Rhodes is doing is doing initial data collection. And then um, I believe it's six month out data collection and then 12 month out. Okay. So some, facts about the timeline for these payments. ACCD is still developing their application to receive the payments from the fund, um, and that should be ready to go on February 1st. And they have reser reserved about $50,000 to support future needs, so there is some reservation of funds for um, additional support in the future. And as I noted there, there is an, an additional $50,000 that is anticipated to be deposited into that fund. So that would leave $100,000 um, in the fund to support some future needs of future businesses or existing businesses. Okay, um, so now we're getting into the barriers to accessing the cannabis industry um, and our recommendations to the legislature. Um, this slide really, the synopsis here is that um, it's the board's position that the biggest barrier to the 
having success in the cannabis industry is lack of access to capital. Um, we talk a little bit about the startup costs can be very high um, and how cannabis businesses are really limited in um, their options for securing financing. And that limited available lending means that most cannabis businesses have to fund themselves from the beginning. Um, disproportionate enforcement of cannabis prohibition um, has really left a legacy of racial injustice in the now legal cannabis industry. Um, when, and we've got several links here that um, support these statements that uh, black and Hispanic people have been historically targeted by criminal legal enforcement and sentencing practices, and that has resulted in really profound um, generational impacts um, that include longstanding economic harm. These racial disparities persist in Vermont. And given that businesses that are owned by people of color are less likely to have their financing needs met than that of white owned businesses, um, the limited access to financing as described on the previous slide is um, in all likelihood going to disproportionately impact um, people of color who are looking to have access to the cannabis industry. And then this is a slide that talks about barriers to success, uh, sustaining success in the industry. Um, so not only are, are those financial impacts going to affect uh, people's ability to enter the industry, but also their um, ability to ha achieve some success in the industry once they are licensed. Um, so the slide details some of the kind of unique costs that cannabis businesses face that um, businesses in other industries don't face. And that includes the banking and insurance services, both of which are very expensive. Um, and some of uh, the municipal barriers that we are seeing um, happening. So some municipalities are imposing local local like control barriers on cannabis businesses. Um, and those sometimes are resulting in litigation costs. And then also testing cannabis is required to ensure quality. And as we know, testing is very costly increases as a business sort of expands its uh, product line. Okay, um, so here we're getting into our recommendations. So new applicants for um, cannabis establishment licenses are slowing down as we know, but um, the proportion of social equity applicants that are applying now, um, as opposed to in the when we first started opening application windows is, is higher. Um, so there is some sustained interest in the industry by social equity applicants. Um, so as a result, we the board is um, indicating that access to additional funding is necessary, both to ensure that um, we continue to provide economic opportunities to social equity applicants that would like to join the industry, but also um, our existing licensees that are trying to achieve some measure of success in the industry. Um, so here is our specific recommendation that a portion of the excise tax be set aside as a financial resource for social equity applicants, um, or specifically that a portion of the excise tax be, um, be allocated to the Cannabis Business Development Fund, and that that uh, fund should be available to both existing licensees and also applicants um, to ensure that these economic opportunities are being provided to individuals from communities that were harmed by prohibition. You know how many other states do that? <clears throat> Have a portion of the tax yeah. devoted to it? Either community reinvestment or specifically to support social equity. Applicants. Yes, it's not high. I don't have and the exact two, number. Right? For three, maybe? Yes, I think that sounds right. New York, Illinois. Yep. It is a small yeah. number, certainly. So, as, as you mentioned, um, another one of our recommendations is that um, the board is, or that the legislature create um, a reinvestment fund to funnel some of the revenue from the cannabis industry to communities that were disproportionately harmed by cannabis prohibition. Um, and reinvesting that revenue into those communities would be a much um, further reaching approach to mitigating some of the harms. Um, given that not everybody who has been harmed by prohibition wants to be a part of the cannabis industry. Okay, and last slide. Our um, final recommendation is 
to allow for some additional license types, including a delivery license, which would um, create another point of entry to the market with low economic barriers, and also creating an on-site consumption pilot program. And the recommendation here would be to address kind of the ongoing racial disparities in drug enforcement that persist in Vermont. Um, and just a note that, you know, current law prohibits consuming cannabis in ev basically everywhere, um, all places of public accommodation, public spaces, federal housing, and having um, a location for on-site consumption would offer all people a safe place to consume and reduce the possibility of criminal legal enforcement. And there you have it. That is your um, social equity, equity report to the legislature. Any questions about that? No, I know it represents <clears throat> hundreds of hours of work between you and <clears throat> the board and everyone at ACCD and Susanna and everyone. Thanks for putting that together so concisely. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Great. All right, are, are you ready for your next agenda item? Yes. Yeah. Um, one statement I did want to make before I jump into my report um, is just to back up something that Julie mentioned earlier um, in the opening remarks. And I would just like to emphasize that all of our staff are really dedicated to public servants. Um, and one of the benefits to having such a um, small organization, to being such a small organization, small agency, is that our work is really collaborative, basically at every level. And as a result, all of our staff have a really um, firm grasp of the rules and the guidance. Um, so I would really encourage that applicants and licensees and their representatives treat all of our staff with the respect that they deserve. Um, and that really includes refraining from escalating your issue or making a special request of certain staff or of the board. Um, if the staff member that you heard from, <laughs> if you don't like the answer that they provided you. Um, I think that just to really foster that respect uh, between the regulatory body and, um, and our regulated community, I would encourage um, respectful treatment of all of our staff. So with that, I will move on. Okay, so here we have our um, our our new. This is this is going to look different from our register that we've presented in in prior board meetings. New your new look. <laughs> <laughs> new look. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in. I think we're a little bit behind schedule, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump right in. Um, we're starting out, as the chair mentioned at the beginning, with some um, performance measures. So the following, the the next several slides detail some average time frames for licensure based on um, license type. So that's where we're going to get started today. Um, so again, this is we're we're talking about the adult use program right now. Um, this slide shows the average days from submission to approval for all um, cannabis establishment applicants. And I know that the text there on the right is really tricky to to see, and um, there's kind of a lot of information here, but on average, um, the number of days between submission and approval of an application for a cannabis establishment license is 83.6. Um, so we're going to jump in and break out those numbers um, by a license type in a moment. But the first um, piece of data that um, we have here is the average days from submission to approval um, compared between all applicants and social equity applicants. So you can see 83.6 reflects um, the average number of days for all applications. But when you um, when you pull out just those applicants that have been approved um, for social equity status, that number of days drops to 37.2. So I think that's a great reflection of the work that staff is doing to prioritize our social equity applicants. So now we're going to pull apart these numbers by license type. 
Um, so here you can see that for cultivation applicants, the average number of days from submission to approval is just barely under 90. Um, and I'd note that this number is higher than every other license type except for integrated licensees. And this is likely for a number of reasons. Um, first, I would just point out that cultivators really made up the bulk of our early applications when we first opened um, the window for applying for a cannabis establishment license. The vast majority of, of those applicants were um, cultivators. And during that really intensive phase of licensing um, over the summer, we did not have a full team of licensing staff. Um, and the other important thing to note is that the very first, these applicants, many of these applicants were applying under the very first version of our, of our application. Um, and that version of the application had no logic, it had no conditioning, and then essentially allowed applicants to submit something that um, needed a lot of corrections. Um, so there was quite a bit of support that our staff was needed to do, um, especially in that early, early version of our application. And by logic, we mean it didn't, it wasn't intuitive, right? It didn't skip to the next page automatically. That's correct. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the average days from submission to approval for manufacturer applications is 67.4. Um, and it looks like it's about the same based on no difference among the three different tiers of manufacturing license. Um, average days for wholesale applications was 73.7. And testing labs was 20, on average 20.3 days. And I would just note here that um, we waived all of the licensing requirements um, for Applicants that were seeking a testing lab license, if they were already certified, um, if they had a current certification under the Cannabis Quality Control Program established by um, the Agency of Agriculture. So all that um, those labs really needed to do was to, to submit proof of their cert current certification and current certification number and the scope of their certified testing areas in order to get their license. And here's the number, 166 days from submission to approval for our integrated applicants. So the only note I would make um, about that number is that those applications are really quite complex and intensive given that um, they are licensed to do the whole shebang. And then here is the number, 56.2 average days from submission to approval for a retail license. And about the same, 53.2 days um, for uh, an employee ID card. Can I ask a question about the ID card? When someone submits an application, they get a temporary card almost right away. Is that right? Or pretty soon? They're not waiting 53 days before they can begin working. Is That's that correct. You, they can get, um, as long as they do not disclose any um, presumptively disqualifying offenses on their application. Um, they can get a temporary card um, while we await the results of their cr criminal history record. They also have to attest that they don't have one, right? Not just that they're not disclosing them. That's correct. They have to attest that they don't have any presumptively disqualifying offenses, yes. <laughs> okay. So now the next couple of slides detail the new um, license application submissions, what they look like. Um, so this is from the date of the la the day after the last board meeting to um, January 23rd. So it's not up until today. But you can see that um, we've got a pretty good division of um, applicants among the three statuses, standard, social equity, and economic empowerment. So it was 17% at the end of December in the, in the social equity report that we just went through was like 14 or 17% for social equity. Of, of licensees, okay. yes. And these are our new application submissions, which is, yes, 27%. Yeah. Okay, and then this is a breakdown among social equity, economic, economic empowerment, and standard among the different license types. You can see that our we've got you know the big ones are indoor 
um, tier two manufacturing and retail for the last 30 days. This slide is just an overview of our, um, the number of issued licenses by um, license type and tier. So these numbers are current as of today. So we've got um, 547 and that, but that is inclusive of employee ID cards. So we've, as of today, we've got 326 issued cannabis establishment licenses. Okay, and then these numbers, based on the numbers um, on the prior slide of licensed cultivators, uh, this is a little bit of a picture of our licensed, the amount of canopy that we currently have licensed um, versus the amount of canopy that uh, is licensed and utilized right now. So I think, you know, the board has been doing a lot of talking about um, the amount of canopy that is currently being utilized by our cultivators, given that it's the first year of cultivation. Um, there is a, there, I would say that this year, um, our cultivators are probably using less space um, than they will in future years. So licensed indoor canopy is 117,000 square feet. Um, outdoor is 450,000, outdoor and mixed. And then utilized, and, and I want to emphasize that these are really rough estimates um, based on what our field agents are seeing during their inspections. So the estimate is that approximately 75% of our indoor licensed canopy is being utilized, um, while closer to half of our outdoor licensed canopy is being utilized. So it's likely that that utilized number is going to change significantly um, as our outdoor cultivators enter their second year of growing. Any questions about that? That's a good benchmark. Yeah, I mean, what it, it kind of tells me is even current licensees, even if they were utilizing 100% of their capacity, we're not necessarily to the point where supply will outweigh demand in our model estimates that would force us to think a little bit right. more critically and strategically on how we don't oversaturate things. And by not utilize, there's like, it, no part of the canopy, like no seedlings, no, it's just not used at all, right? Mm -hmm. With the benchmark. That's right. Just, That's correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the next slide is our retail location map. Um, and this map is going to be available on our website later this week. Um, I just wanted to note that the blue pins are um, licensees, actual licensed retail establishments and the red pens are uh, retail applicants. Um, and I also wanted to note that those red pens, um, are they do not reflect the precise location of these proposed retailers. They are just randomly dropped within the borders of the municipality to give a visual representation of the potential density of our retailers. So um, nothing precise about those red pens. Very pretty. Yep. With a couple of concentrations. Yep. And those concentrations are where you would expect them given how commerce works in our state, mm -hmm. right? For sure. Yep. And to and to address that a little bit, here's um, some breakdown of where we've got some areas of density uh, in the state for retail locations. Um, and this is just a little bit of a picture of what what we currently have licensed in Burlington and what is coming. Um, so retail applications in the queue, we've got six of them for Burlington. Um, and then Rutland is probably the second highest area of density um, given the two new applications that are in the queue. And then Brattleboro, Morrisville, and Derby. I don't know if you would really call that an area of density, but um, those are the, the, three, the three other municipalities where we have um, potentially have three cannabis establishments. how that density would change if we had a default provision of opts in versus the default being opt out. It might not change like Morrisville and Derby, but it would probably change Burlington to, I mean, we've talked about this, South Burlington, Williston. Right. Okay, next. 
Now we're going to get into our product registration slides. Um, so this is product registration by the numbers. <clears throat> so as of the 23rd of this month, um, we had 1,057 total product registration applications submitted to the board. Um, and of those, 493 are awaiting review, 248 are in are an incomplete status. So we have um, reached back out to the applicant to let them know that they need to provide us with more information before we can register their product. Um, and 282 products are registered. Um, and then the rest are either um, denied or withdrawn. So this slide provides a little bit, just a visual of what that looks like. We've got um, nearly half are in submitted status. Um, and then about a quarter, a little more than a quarter are, are registered. Um, so we do have, um, I think that we've talked about this at a prior board meeting, we do have uh, additional staff um, that are addressing sort of the backlog of product registration applications that have come in the door. Um, and we are developing a plan to, um, to keep on top of those applications as they come in. Pace is also just picked up due to this kind of migration to Salesforce. I feel like that's my kind yes. of understanding. Yes. Which is a review, I should say. Right. There's a backlog and we'll get it cleared. It'll be a smoother process for internal folks and external folks moving forward. Next slide is just a picture of what types of products our um, licensees are seeking to have registered. The vast majority, as you can see, is flour, and then we've got smaller proportions of edibles, tinctures, and concentrates. You might not know off the top of your head, but I presume we don't have any solid concentrates that are 60% THC or less. Um, there is, I believe, a, an application for a just under 60% concentrate, yes. Okay, next couple of slides are um, provide some detail on our inspections. So here's some numbers about our inspections um, that are reflecting just that period of time that we have had um, compliance agents on staff, which is just, um, we've, I think we've, some of our staff joined us in, in August, but we really started doing um, inspections in September. So um, total full-time compliance agents during this reporting period was four. Um, we have we do have a couple more now, which is great news. Um, and in that time, the staff conducted 422 inspections. And I would note that these are total inspections includes um, our new inspections, um, any investigations, any routine like revisits, and any unscheduled inspections are all included in these numbers. Um, average inspections per week is 22 or five and a half per uh, compliance agent. And um, that average hours per inspection is the average number of hours that our agents are spending with the license or the applicant or the licensee. So it does is not inclusive of drive time, which is I think on average an hour there and an hour home. And report writing, I assume that there's some after action that has to happen. That's right. Yes, and so we'll, we'll likely have some additional detail on um, data about kind of the, the what, are, what our compliance agents are spending their time doing, but this is really intended to reflect like how much time is actually being spent with our applicants and licensees. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I know some people might look at this and say, well, five and a half per week, three hours per, like that's not a 40 hour work week, but uh, you know, you think about all the resources we're dedicating to product registration from these folks and all the time they've spent building our uh, inventory tracking platform as well. Uh, it really is an impressive amount of work. Yep. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, because we're such a small staff, we we collaborate on all of it. So yeah. our guidance documents, um, our development of all of our programs really heavily involves the compliance agents also. Yeah. requires a report. Yeah. Meetings. 
unfortunately we have we have to have those too okay um this is a picture of our enforcement actions uh so far from september through january so i've just broken them out by the category um the category of violation that they fall under um and really under the 10 closed enforcement actions we're really considering an action to be closed um once the letter of warning has been issued since um the, the majority of these are, are lower um, severity categories. Uh, these have primarily been addressed through a letter of warning. So once the letter of warning or the notice violation has been issued and the licensee has remedied their noncompliance, that is when a matter is considered closed. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Okay, and then the last couple of slides before we get in, onto the staff recommendations are just a, a general picture of our um, medical program. So this is the patient and caregiver numbers, um, and this looks all the way back to 2009. Um, so this really shows the, the steep um, the joining of patients to the registry and then the gradual drop off that we're seeing. Um, since really 2017, but more, more sharp decline um, in, in just in the last year. And to kind of get a put a finer point on that decline over the last year, here is um, the number of patients and caregivers just over the last 12 months. So you can see we've dropped um, from our numbers at the beginning of the year, which were over 4,500, to um, I think we're just around uh, hovering around 3,700 now in January of 23. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the recommendations if everyone's ready for that. So um, here are staff recommendations on social equity status, um, and then we also have one recommendation for overcoming presumptive disqualification for an applicant for an employee ID card. <clears throat> so we have submission um, 2599, staff is, is recommending approval of social equity status. Submission 2348, set staff is recommending approval of social equity status. Um, submission 2496, also recommending approval of social equity status. Uh, submission 2603, recommending approval of social equity status. And then one um, submission, 2492, the submission staff is recommending denial of social equity status. Um, and submission number 2602 is an applicant for an employee ID card whose criminal history record reflects uh, presumptively disqualifying offense. And staff is recommending um, approval of this employee ID card um, because the applicant meets the criteria for overcoming presumptive disqualification as set out in the rule. Um, and these last two submissions are um, will be the topic of conversation during executive session. Okay, and then the following slide is the list of applicants that have demonstrated compliance with all requirements for their cannabis establishment license that's contained in the rule and in statute. Let's see if I can see them. Um, so we have I hopes applying for a mixed tier one cultivation license. Vermont Cultivars applying for mixed um, tier one cultivation license. Medi Farms applying for an indoor tier three cultivation license. Palm Trees applying for an indoor tier one cultivation license. Giving Tree Hemp Farm applying for a tier two cultivation, indoor cultivation license. Drink Tonic applying for a tier three manufacturing license. Somewhere on the Mountain applying for a tier two manufacturing license. Stone Leaf Process, applying for a Tier 2 manufacturing license. Um, some Sunset Light Cannabis, applying for a Tier 2 manufacturing license. BT Skunk Works, uh, applying for a Tier 2 manufacturing license. Vermont Select, applying for a Tier 2 manufacturing license. Freedom Flower, Tier 2 manufacturing license. Flower First, Tier 2 manufacturing license. Can Max, applying for a retail license. Big Intelligence Group applying for a retail license. Formulation Station Vermont applying for a Tier 2 manufacturing license. 
Mr. Tree applying for a tier one indoor cultivation license. BB Can applying for a retail license. The Higher Collective applying for an indoor tier one cultivation license. Matterhorn Apothecary applying for a retail license. Uh, River Valley Group applying for an outdoor tier one cultivation license. Emerald Roots applying for a tier one indoor cultivation license and Burn Legacy Cannabis applying for a retail license. So we have 23 applicants up for board approval today. Great. And that is it. So the board would like to enter executive session. Yeah, and just to um, just put a little a bit of context in that, you know, we're dealing with um, in executive session, two applicants, they're um, very personal details about their application, including criminal history records that we need to discuss. Anything that we decide could be the subject of litigation. And so, um, you know, the board needs to enter into executive session in order to protect both the applicant and the board's decision in case this were to lead to litigation. So is there a motion um, to enter into executive session for purposes of reviewing staff recommendations around the social equity denial and um, the uh, employee ID card approval? Yes, I move that the CCB go into executive session to consider confidential attorney-client communications made for the purposes of providing professional legal services to the body. And that executive session is required because premature general public knowledge regarding such communications would clearly place the board at substantial disadvantage. I further move that the board include Susanna Davis, executive director, and Jay Green, uh, racial equity research and policy analyst, uh, both from the Office of Racial Equity for the state of Vermont into executive session. Second. I hold second. All, right. um, All in favor? All right. All right. <laughs> so it's it's roughly twelve thirty right now. I've read the memos. I think I think we can do this in twenty minutes. Um, so why don't we come back at ten to two fifty? It looks like we've scared everybody away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're back and we're still recording. Okay. All right. I'm going to resume the meeting. We got finished with the executive session a little bit early. The current time is 2.43 p.m. on January 30th, 2023. Um, we are out of executive session. We discussed the kind of specific facts that underlie the staff recommendations around a social equity denial recommendation and a overcoming presumptive disqualification for an employee ID card. And I think we are ready to um, vote on all of the staff recommendations as a package. Is there a motion for that? Yep. I move that the board accept each of the recommendations as presented to us by staff in this meeting. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, um, great. So um, last thing on our agenda today is public comment. Um, and so we do this the same way we always do. Um, if you join via the video link and would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. Um, we'll do our best to call on you in the order that you've raised your hands. And um, then we'll shift to people to join via the phone. Or a second. Maybe only second. Oops. Um, Tito. Hi, can you all hear, hear me okay? Yeah. So uh, just thank you all so much, uh, James, Julie, and Kyle, and Bryn, and uh, Denise, and Chris, and Mike, and even Ray. Uh, you you all have, have personally helped us um, at, at one time or another. And what a journey it's been. Uh, thank you all so much. Grand openings on Valentine's Day. Everyone's invited. Thanks, you. Bobby. Hey, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all. Uh, you know, really appreciate this update and uh, looking forward to working closer with you all. Uh, beyond that, it's just super disheartening to hear everything you said at the beginning of this meeting in, in regards to, you know, 
being berated in uh, low-key sexism or not so low-key, apparently. So uh, I'm sorry you all have to endure that. And, uh, you know, if someone wants to slap me some names under the table, I'll have some words with people. <laughs> have a good one. Thanks, Bobby. Um, again, we're in the uh, public comment portion of uh, the meeting, and so uh, if you join by the link and would like to comment, um, please raise your virtual hand. If you join by the phone, um, you can unmute yourself by hitting star six if you'd like to make a public comment. Bridget. Hey, uh, just glad to see the delivery and uh, pilot program recommendations for on-site consumption. And just would recommend, if it's not already being considered, that the health department be brought in on the on-site consumption, because I'm assuming that food and beverage is going to be an important part of that program. That's all. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bridget. Anyone else for a public comment? Dave. Hi, guys. Um, so at the start of the meeting, uh, you mentioned um, DLL uh, and uh, licensure for uh, selling tobacco paraphernalia. And um, so, and I see Carrie back there. I hope you can hear me. Uh, in 2018, um, we changed we we changed the law in Vermont uh, to legalize possession and growing your own. But in that same piece of legislation, we also legalized possession and sale of cannabis paraphernalia. Cannabis paraphernalia was previously illegal to possess and sell. And that's why prior to 2018, it was very common for all the tobacco paraphernalia shops, well, all the all the head shops, uh, to call themselves, you know, tobacco use only. They would have the signs up for tobacco use only. You know, people would giggle about it, and uh, you know, they, people would think like, oh, I'm going to get kicked out if I mention this is a bong for weed. And we changed that. And when we changed that, we did not give DLL any kind of regulatory authority over cannabis paraphernalia. And in 2017, 2018, 2019, or 2020, we went through a lot of different iterations in the legislature over cannabis regulation. And the legislature considered giving DLC at the time, now DLL, some jurisdiction over the cannabis industry and ultimately decided not to. And the reasons for that, you know, there's a couple of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that, you know, DLC, DLL, they're cops. And we don't want cops uh, involved in the regulation of cannabis. They've done a pretty awful job of dealing with cannabis so far. Um, and so this board was created as an independent agency um, to deal with cannabis. And you have taken a, in my opinion, fantastic education first approach to compliance. And your compliance agents from carry on down all the way through have been partners uh, to, to my license business, to all of my clients who are licensees, a, a true education first approach that is not in the DNA of DLL. I don't believe that their interpretation of the statute is correct. Uh, I believe that cannabis stores are selling cannabis paraphernalia not tobacco paraphernalia, and should be allowed to continue to do this without any DLL oversight. I believe that applying for getting a DLL tobacco license exposes cannabis retailers to a level of regulatory risk that is unnecessary and uncalled for by law. And I cannot recommend 
to my clients that they go that route, even though not going that route exposes them to a risk that DLL will issue them a citation for failing to have a license. This is a very difficult problem for the cannabis industry right now. As you said, there was a raid on one just last week, and it wasn't just come in, check out whether we're selling the pipes and have the right license. They also did an undercover purchase, an underage person trying to get in. This is squarely the CCB's jurisdiction. You are the agency that's supposed to be sending people in with underage fake IDs trying to get into our stores, not DLL. This is a big problem. I was surprised by the tone of your remarks at the start of the session, indicating that the CCB perhaps is okay with this position by DLL. It should not be. They are encroaching upon your turf, for one, but two, they are, they are endangering the cannabis industry in its infancy. I have reached out to key players in the legislature about this already. I will be pressing this very hard in the weeks ahead, and I really want the CCB to join me in that effort to support efforts to make a clear delineation between cannabis sales and tobacco sales. If that means making a change in the law to more explicitly prohibit cannabis stores from selling tobacco, I believe you would find support for that from the cannabis industry. And, um, and so that, yeah, that's it. I, I really want you to think about this and, and, and join us in pushing back against this overreach by DLL. And if uh, Commissioner Knight or anyone else from DLL is listening, I will tell you, I for one am ready to challenge this determination by DLL in court, and I believe that we will prevail if that if it came to that. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Liz. Hi, yes, thank you for creating this space. I just wanted to spend a moment here to talk about uh, another facet of equity that I would love um, some guidance and support from the board on. I am the director of the Vermont State Labor Council, AFL-CIO, which is our state's federation of labor unions. And we have unions that have um, worked with cannabis workers in other states and are really trying to find ways to create um, a healthy uh, environment for workers and employers by incentivizing labor peace uh, in when there are potential um, organizing campaigns coming up or just establishing labor neutrality um, from the beginning so workers feel comfortable in exercising their fundamental right to form a union. And some other states have done this through incentivizing licensure by uh, employers agreeing to um, licensees and employers agreeing to labor peace agreements, which basically just state <laughs> what the law is um, in terms of respecting workers' rights. But unfortunately, we are in a state in this country where we have to remind employers of those laws. And so these agreements are very important. And so I would just love to discuss or just uh, figure out how we can go about um, having a discussion and serious consideration of amending rule one to incentivize protecting workers' rights and labor peace. Um, essentially, a licensee would be able to uh, uh, agree to having a labor peace agreement as one of the four choices in section D. And I did submit this officially as well through um, the board's website. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions with respect to this, but I would love to just hear from uh, others about how um, we can get this discussion going. Great, thanks, Liz. Anyone else for public comment? Uh, raise your virtual hand if you join by the link or hit star six to unmute your phone if you'd like to make a comment. Yarim. 
Hi guys, how are you again? I hope you're doing well. Uh, one question, well, question I guess I had, and I don't know if you, you can, if you can clarify, how many of those product registrations uh, not being final are based on awaiting COAs from the labs? That's all I have. Thanks, Yareem. Um, I don't have the answer to that off the top of my head, but uh, we can see if someone from licensing can get back in touch. At least make a note to mm -hmm. cover that point specifically in our next meeting. Yeah. Anyone else for public comment? I think I'm going to close the public comment window. Um, then and uh, thank everyone for joining. Happy New Year. Um, you know, the legislature is in session now and, you know, a lot of the constrictions that apply to the board and our rules are statutory. And so if you have kind of advice about things that really intersect with the cannabis laws in the state, um, please do reach out to your legislators. With that, I will adjourn the meeting.